So we'll go ahead and get started. Good evening, and thank you for attending our third reparation town hall. Uh, let us begin with a moment of silence for the recent historic and uh, the recent historic murders of the black community and our allies in the name of racial terror. Just a moment of silence, please. I'm on the reparations. Kind In addition, yeah, if you are not presenting right now, if you don't mind muting yourself. Thank you. In addition, community, we ask that you keep Jacob Blake in your thoughts and your prayers for a full recovery. And we ask for you to send continued strength and prayers to his entire family, the Blake family and the entire family. In November of 2019, we passed resolution 126R19, restricting the first $10 million of cannabis sales tax to fund reparations for the black community in Evanston. Uh, we have worked from a list of community priorities to advance our first remedy policies with hopes of awarding the first direct or collective benefit in early 2021 uh, at the latest. Until recently, when you heard reparations, it generally referred to H.R. 40, a slavery, a federal slavery reparation goal. But recently, cities across America have begun to take local action to repair damages in the black community. From years of institutional and structural black racial uh, oppression. Our city has led that way. Generally, when you heard of reparations, uh, you hear of compensation. And compensation, of course, is a significant uh, component of reparation because our wealth has been stripped away from us. Our goals include compensation, but we are pursuing full reparations or full repair here in our city, which includes cessation, assurance of non-repetition, restitution, compensation, rehabilitation, and satisfaction. So I want to say I'm really proud that reparations is happening in our city already. Please learn more about the work of Shorefront Legacy in partnership with our uh, historic commission. Dino Robinson has led us into passing our African American heritage sites, which will honor uh, historically significant locations across the city um, beyond the fifth ward. So find out more about that. The Daily Northwestern has been doing a series as well as we can learn more about it at Dino Robinson. But of course, there are uh, examples in the Fifth Ward. And Dino may share more about that um, later. So reparations in our city um, is being worked on by a subcommittee which includes myself, Audrey Rainey, Audrey Braithwaite, and it's staffed by our city manager, our assistant city manager, Kimberly Richardson, uh, Tashik, and attorney Nick Cummings. Um, we've hosted regular public meetings since January to advance the goals of our resolution. Um, this work has been uh, complex, and it has taken not only our community, but it's taken national content experts, as well as reparation leaders to support us each step of the way. So with that, I wanna thank you to our team of local advisors that have been meeting weekly, late night evening until 10.30, sometimes later. Uh, and that group of advisor includes Dino Robinson, Dr. Reverend Dr. Michael Neighbors, uh, Pastor Monte Dillard, Judge Lionel Jean Baptiste, who is a NARC commissioner um, in Ottoman Braithwaite. And we have to say thank you to the entire NARP Commission. A special thank you to the team that has been assigned to Evanston, which includes uh, the convener, Dr. Ron Daniels, uh, Dr. Iva Carruthers, attorney in Kichi Taifa, and uh, Judge Lionel Jean Baptiste. They have invested countless hours of education and advising us throughout this process. Thank you to the community at large for all that you have done. Uh, your leadership has been important, and this work is actually impossible without your voice. Thank you to the ally community for your support. There are too many others to thank individually, 
But I do want to say a special thank you to the leaders that have been working on a special education reparation uh, working group. And you will hear more about, about them and their work later uh, in this presentation. So I just wanna thank you all for coming. Wanna set the expectation. We do have an agenda. I believe we can share that agenda um, on our screen but I will actually share it as well. So we will move forward with um, presentations from our subcommittee. We will have reports from Alderman Rainey and Alderman Braithwaite. We will then have a special stakeholder presentation. It will be a video, really excited to see that. And we will then have a um, a report that is provided by those that have been working on education. In addition to that, we're gonna have a very special uh, guest, Spencer Jourdain Jr., the son of our own Alderman uh, Jourdain, and Dino Robinson will do that introduction. We then will have uh, what we've been waiting for, a final assessment by the NARC commissioners. We will hear from the commissioners, their report, on uh, our work here in Evanston as they have uh, mentored and supported us throughout the process. And lastly, we're gonna hear from uh, Danny Glover who joined us at our initial town hall, who is the UN ambassador, as well as lastly, we'll hear from Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, who is uh, the leader and sponsor of HR 40. And I wanna report a couple of things. Um, as we work towards repair in Evanston, uh, we are in full support of HR 40 and Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee's leadership. I'm really excited to share that HR 40 has more sponsors in the House and the Senate and ever in its history, and that momentum is building up for it to be uh, introduced or some action taken later. We will certainly hear more about that when the Congresswoman um, joins us. But Evanston, you should know that we passed in 2002 a resolution that was led by uh, then Alderman uh, Lionel Jean Baptiste, now Judge Lionel Jean Baptiste. He led us in passing a resolution in support and solidarity of HR 40. So, with that, we will move through um, this agenda. We have a lot to cover. And next we will have our uh, reparation subcommittee reports and it looks like I'm leading. So general updates, um, and I covered many of them in my opening remarks. We have been uh, having public meetings on Fridays. The community is welcome to participate and have comment. Um, we are working initially on a housing policy because that was the priority that the community led with last summer. Last summer, when this work began, we had several community meetings and we took feedback on what reparations looks like to our residents here in Evanston. And due to um, housing policy, zoning policy that discriminated and oppressed the black community that stripped away wealth, um, we advanced housing as a priority. In addition to that, um, our resolution states that we'll be working on economic development um, initiatives. And more broadly, we want to um, embrace and include education, which, could, which will also include wellness um, and other areas of education. And that's why we have a group of leaders that have been working um, on that and you'll learn more from them. So at this point, we are looking to um, have action tomorrow at nine o'clock a.m. it is a Zoom meeting. You're welcome to join us on our first policy. And we will continue this work um, based on the priorities of the community. And of course, based on how the funding is, um, is comes to us local at a, at a municipal level. And you'll learn more about that from Audubon Rainey, but we have a $10 million commitment and that is coming in over years of tax revenue. So we are not able to roll out one comprehensive plan. 
but we thought that we would roll out plans as we do have funding because the need for repair in the black community is urgent. We have, as we've stated before, a $46,000 economic uh, divide or household income divide between black and white Evanston. And we expect that only to grow uh, with the damages uh, from COVID and how that has um, devastated our community, especially the small business community and those that have worked uh, jobs that they have no longer been able to work due to COVID. So we are um, looking forward to pass the initial remedy and we will continue to move forward with a, a public process that we have been able to um, design so that the community can own this process. This work does not continue without the community's voice, the stakeholders specifically, the black community of Evanston specifically, those that have been injured uh, due to our unfortunate historic past and even current conditions. So tomorrow at our meeting, we will also pass a policy that will um, inform how uh, remedy and how our budget is uh, prioritized going forward. So tomorrow is a very important meeting for us. It's going to be our first action and it comes with a lot of investment. We've had presentations, we've had countless meetings with content experts, but we want you to know that this work is not done lightly. It is done with a lot of thought and commitment, a lot of education along the way, because again, there has not been any best practice to reference as we do this work. So right now in these social times, as we deal with the trauma that we see every time we turn on of our television or turn on to Facebook and the trauma that we're feeling in our community due to the disparities of the impact of coronavirus, uh, we are proud that we are advancing this work in Evanston and our commitment predates the current uh, social awakening um, here in the United States. So thank you to Evanston. And um, with that, I will um, pass it on to Audrey Rainey. And after that, Audrey Braithwaite. Thank you, um, Robin. Thank you very much. And nobody could appreciate anybody's leadership more than I appreciate yours, and I know the entire council does. Um, good evening. On January 1, the sale of recreational cannabis became legal in the state of Illinois. Communities around the state were enabled by the legislature to place a municipal tax on the product. The city of Evanston placed the maximum tax, which is 3% on the sale of all adult cannabis. We know that over the years, blacks in Evanston, as in other communities, have been disproportionately impacted by marijuana enforcement, conviction, and incarceration. When Alderman Simmons brought the reparations project to the Evanston City Council, we, know, we knew we could not shortchange repairing the great damage that had been done to our black community. It only made sense to fund the reparations program with all of the revenue from the 3% cannabis tax, along with private donations and foundation support. The Evanston City Council supported a resolution stating that all of the revenue from that tax until we reached a total of $10 million will go to the reparations fund. We have one small dispensary in our town, just one. We have reached, we have received very good news regarding some exciting changes about to take place, and that is it is expanding, doubling in size over the next month. Also, Governor Pritzker is about to finally release new licenses, and we are very hopeful that some of our residents who are social equity participants in these licenses will be setting up shop, adding to our reparations budget. We have to keep in mind that this is a very new, very immature effort, and the first taxes um, will begin to be, have begun to be collected, and the first were on January 1, 2020. In fact, Evanston will not receive any of the revenue from the state until October. I've been advised that the first month 
July, our tax generated for the City of Evanston Reparation Fund was $35,000, August is $40,000, and it's anticipated that those numbers will exponentially increase going forward for this dispensary. And don't forget, we're expecting one or two more in the next year. So thank you for your continued commitment. And next, Peter Braithwaite is going to explain the housing rep uh, remedy. Thank you everyone for being here and for supporting and teaching us about going forward. Uh, good evening and welcome everyone. Just thank you Alderman Simmons for your continued leadership. Thank you very much Alderman Rainey uh, for the financial update uh, and welcome to our residents. Um, since our last meeting, there's been so much going on in our nation uh, that it, and, and thank you for the statements at the top of the meeting, Alderman Simmons. Um, I think it underscores the importance of this work and the need for us to continue to work on our local uh, community. Um, I also want to thank our the members of city council that have joined us this evening that are that are in support in in keeping track of what we're what we're doing this evening. Um, as we broadcast, there is a group of young black leaders right now uh, taking action in a peaceful protest in support of uh, of uh, Jacob Blake. And without further ado, I'll just want to thank them so much for their efforts in bringing awareness to the town. Um, so to jump into to the remedy that we that we've been working on, it, I would be remiss if I didn't first start uh, thank. Alderman Simmons, as well as the community that made this a, a priority. So what we are proposing, um, and, and we still have some, some work to do, is a program that will offer up to $25,000 in assistance to eligible residents to use to either, number one, purchase a home in Evanston, to also rehab a home in Evanston, and we're also working on assistance that will be used to help the qualified res, uh, residents uh, catch up on their mortgage or abate their taxes. The eligible residents are Black Evanston uh, homeowners who, or excuse me, Black Evanston residents who have experienced discrimination or tied to families that have experienced discriminations at the hands of the city of Evanston. Uh, they have to be direct descendants of those Evanstonians who've lived in town specifically during the time period of 19, nine, excuse me, 1919 and 1969, when the city either discriminated or failed to stop discrimination of housing in Evanston. Moving forward, our committee will continue to work through the detailed process to further define the conditions and the policy in partnership with our community who have been very faithful in attending our subcommittee meetings. Uh, moving forward, we'll continue to direct our staff to finalize the program, including, and this is what we have to flush out, the administration, the application process, and finally a presentation to, to our city council that will be all a public meeting. Once approved, uh, our city council will begin to issue the applications in conjunction as the funds uh, come in. So definitely more to come. Alderman Simmons mentioned it at the top of the meeting. We are inviting those that are interested uh, in hearing more and participating tomorrow beginning at 915. I believe Kimberly, the information is on our website for those that are interested in joining. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. So just in closing, I want to, Alderman Simmons said it before, but really thank our staff, uh, Kimberly uh, Richardson, Nick Cummings, uh, also Tashik for their assistance, as well as the residents for their continued support and uh, questions and comments that have led us to this point. Thank you all. Next, we have up, let me get this, um, an update from our education committee that's been working really hard. Our education committee has many responsibilities with two of the priorities being identifying our health disparities uh, affecting Black Evanston, 
as well as identify, identifying education disparities in District 65 and 202. And this is something that we had discussed at a previous meeting. With us this evening, we have Mr. Henry Wilkins, who is, uh, who is uh, chairing that stakeholders committee. Henry, I'll turn it over to you to uh, introduce your message as well as your group. Sure. So um, good evening, everyone. My name is Henry Wilkins. Um, I'm a member of the Education Subcommittee. Before we jump into the update, however, um, we will show a video for a proclamation that um, came out of the work of our Education Subcommittee. And it was written by two of our Education Subcommittee members, along with um, Reverend Dr. Neighbors. And so with that, I will turn over to, I believe, Kim, who will start the video. Proclamation for Black Justice from the Evanston Black Community in response to the urgency of the time. Where there has been recent national and international support for Black Lives Matter and for grassroots protests against racism and reform, there remains a pernicious and egregious anti-Blackness throughout our nation. It has become increasingly evident that we must all rise to meet the challenges of anti-black racism and injustices against black people in our own local communities. Our commitment to the eradication of anti-black racism in every public forum in Evanston necessitates identifying and rooting out all structural, institutional, and systemic discrimination. We therefore stand united and engaged collaboratively and collectively to resist the incessant and unrelenting anti-blackness in our society via the following efforts. To bring attention to violence suffered by black people as a result of a long history of anti-black racism. And we also engage to stop the violence by naming anti-black racism and its ancillary attachments, creating and sustaining programs and providing resources. And we therefore engage to confront low income and indigence in the black community as products of a long history of racialized economic terror and anti-black policies and practices. And we also engage to introduce innovative programs to increase upward mobility for black people and families subsequently ending low income and indigence. We therefore engage to name racial terror that remains prevalent in infrastructure, housing policies and practices, public school curriculum, higher education practices, ecological and geographic locations, law enforcement policies and practices. Economic oppression, political appointments, voting rights, as well as business and corporate policies and practices. And we also engage to develop tactical and strategic teams and processes to end such racial terror. In each of these areas, working with and advising each area for the benefit of black independence, self-determination, and empowerment, and we therefore engage to highlight the significant disparities in healthcare and wellness. Particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic and how black people are dying disproportionately due to factors that can and must be addressed. We also engage to establish wholesale partnerships with medical centers and the healthcare industry to promote preventative and intervention education programs to supplement healthcare costs and to ensure the health, wellness, and safety of black people employed in what have been deemed essential worker occupations. And we also engage to declare that the youth in our communities are our collective responsibility, regardless of organizational affiliation or lack thereof. And we also engage to bring attention to black families' historical and ongoing fight for opportunity and justice in our public schools, and the critical role that out of school and community spaces play in providing learning and educational opportunities for our children. We thus conceptualize learning and education as extending beyond the traditional institution of schooling for black students and their families. And we therefore engage to hold all agencies serving our youth accountable and call on these agencies to utilize the resources to challenge anti-blackness, anti-black racism, and anti-black violence in all its forms. And we therefore engage to declare our support for reparations 
for black community members to begin a process of economic redress for the historical theft of wealth and opportunity. We recognize reparations as a policy that confronts the legacy of anti-blackness specifically and takes aim at anti-black policies and practices that have facilitated the racial inequities of our current moment. And we finally engage that the tenets of this proclamation for black justice will be endorsed and supported by, but not limited to, existing black organizations in Evanston whose names are fixed in here too. All right, so now I'm going to turn over to Oliver Ruff, who is also a member of our education subcommittee to start the update. My name is Oliver Ruff. On behalf of the education subcommittee for reparations, I want to say good evening. I'm so excited that so many organizations supported this proclamation. It was so important that we united for a common purpose. Moving along, I would like to give you a report on the work that the Education Subcommittee has been pursuing. I will start off with the feedback that came out of the reparation meetings last summer. Next, I will share two objectives that the our subcommittee uh, has agreed upon to support and pursue. Lastly, Henry will give you an update on the pursuit of the STEM Community School. Our subcommittee reviewed the feedback provided from the reparations meetings held last summer. We summarized the feedback related to education. For example, we considered early childhood, adding a satellite Oakton Community School Center campus, I'm sorry, and expand apprentice and trade programs. Consideration was based on three components, the ex execution ability, passion and interest, and timing. Two objectives for our education subcommittee emerge out of this assessment. For the short term, education subcommittee is supported by pushing to bring educators' black history to the classroom, leveraging that work was through Shorefront Legacy. With the recent police killings, folks are more empathetic to teaching more black history, to increase individuals' understanding and the appreciation of black people. Covering the black history will help to educate and to enlighten folks of the rep why reparations are needed. There's an opportunity to leverage the Chicago History Fair region, region wide. For the long term, the Education Subcommittee supports the vision of opening a STEM community school located in the Central Core. In the reparations community meetings last summer, it was said that the Fifth Ward was a priority for having that school. This pursuit has been going on for dec decades. And most recently, uh, the effort has been with the 2012 referendum. The school will make the Central Core more appealing and relevant to live and to invest in. And there could be more opportunity to collaborate with the housing and economic empowerment subcommittees. Now, I will turn the remaining portion of this report over to Henry Wilkins, who will give an update on the pursuit of the STEM Community School. Mr. Wilkins. Thank you, Oliver. Good evening. Before um, giving you an update, I want to start off by reading to you the vision 
for the STEM community school. The vision of the STEM community school to open a public community school located in Evanston Central Core will children excel via deep engagement in all academic disciplines, especially in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, and firmly placed on a path to positively shape their lives and impact the world. Parents, educators, and community organizations will work together to develop a holistic caring environment dependent upon high family involvement at both the government and classroom level. I would also like to go on record and say that the intention of this STEM community school is that it be a remedy for the damage that was caused as a result of foster school being moved out of the fifth ward and kids being forced into a one way busing situation. Some of you know this, but in 2020 black kids have to travel further than any other race in any other demographic in Evanston. Also, we know that by not having a school. Uh, makes it difficult for kids' educational experience. In addition to that, there's been a loss of $3 million of educational support over the span of 40 years, and the opportunity gap has been prevalent for decades. So we understand there's gentrification occurring in the fifth war. However, we are constantly thinking of ways to ensure that this school serves the community and the families that we intend to serve. So with that, let's move along to the update. The journey to open this STEM community school began over two and a half years ago. We started with extensive studies to understand past pursuits. The STEM focus was chosen because one, there's a high demand for STEM careers. Over 1 million jobs are open right now in the United States looking for individuals with, with STEM backgrounds. The second reason is that the United States lags other developed countries in terms of math and science. So this pursuit is also about helping increase America's standing in the world. The third reason is that STEM provides a lifetime love of learning. So no matter what career you pursue or what your interests are, Kids are excited about learning and it lasts a lifetime. We've talked to folks that were involved in the most recent pursuit of a fifth ward school. We talked to leaders of Citizens for Better Evanston. Uh, those were the folks that led the, the community outreach for the 2012 referendum. We talked to past District 65 board members and the former District 65 superintendent. Additionally, we did deep dive to understand the voter results of the 2012 referendum where we learned that the referendum did overwhelmingly well in the fifth ward with 67% of the voters saying yes. The referendum also passed in the second ward and also passed in the eighth ward. We understood, we also understood that the results were dismal in the sixth and the seventh ward. Our intent with this approach is that we're approaching it differently than all the other past attempts. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So our intention is to make sure that we're doing things differently and that we win with this go around. In short, in short lots of thought went into this vision creation. Our second phase uh, was focused on building support and increasing awareness. We delivered presentations across the community, we present at the NAACP, we present at Evanston Own It, Northwestern School of Education and Social Policy, the Foster Center Our Place, District 65 Teachers Union, and District 202 Teachers Union, just to name a few places. We talked to key stakeholders in the community, uh, such as the late Hecky Powell, Titans in the community, such as Dolores Holmes, other key influencers, such as Monique Parsons, CEO of the YMCA, Dr. Witherspoon, District 202 Superintendent, Mayor Haggerty, State Representative Robin Gable, and U.S. Representative Jan Schakowsky, just to name a few. Before COVID hit last summer, we were out in the community canvassing, garnering support. We toured Evanston, appearing at various festivals, such as the Jamaica Day Fest celebration. We canvassed at the, at the Farmer's Market in downtown Evanston. We were at Evanston's first night. We were at the Juneteenth Festival, and we attended Evanston's community picnic. 
all this activity to further expand our message. Through this work, we were able to gather over 400 email addresses. In terms of our online presence, we felt that this area was important. So the first thing that we did was to create a website. So if you're interested in, in this work at all, you can go to our website, which is stemschoolevanston.net. We felt that this was a place where people could reference and learn more about the vision and the history of the school pursuit. Simultaneously, we set up a Facebook and Instagram account, and more, more recently, we set up a Twitter account to capture the attention of the younger generation. Lastly, for the past few weeks or a few months, we've been issuing a series of STEM block video episodes hosted by Evanston Live TV and Malika Gardner. This messaging reaches on average a little over a thousand people. So now what's the focus? Currently, we are in the process of trying to secure funding to perform what we have called foundational work, which includes a feasibility study. We want to investigate and analyze the operational, real estate, and funding alternatives for developing a new school in Evanston Central Core to serve primarily this area of Evanston. Also, we want the plans established to include consideration to make sure that this has little impact on Evanston taxpayers and also be done without a need for a tax referendum. To prepare for financial assistance for this work, we submitted an application with the state of Illinois to be a formal 501c3 organization to give individuals and grant issuers and any other organization interested to contribute and receive a tax benefit. Our last major phase is what is kind of in our infancy stage of development, and that is to perform community research. We want to ensure that the STEM community school vision aligns with the community. We already know that a fifth ward school will address the repair. We already know that bringing a school to the fifth ward is important. However, for example, consideration may need to be done in regards to potentially adding arts as a major focus for the school. In closing, if anyone is interested in helping us secure funding for this work, feel free to, to reach us offline. Again, our area of focus is the circle area here, the feasibility study and the community research. We need your help. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. And um, Dino, if you are ready, we would ask that you give any updates on your historical work as well as introduce Mr. Spencer Jardine. Sure. Thank you very much, everyone, this evening and uh, those who are attending in the, um, uh, on the uh, web sphere. Uh, again, my name is Dino Robinson, founder of Shorefront. Um, Back in late June, the City of Evanston and the Reparation Subcommittee tasked uh, myself and Dr. Jenny Thompson, who is the uh, Director of Education at the Evanston History Center, to compile a document uh, entitled Evanston Policies and Practices Directly Affecting the African-American Community from 1900 to 1960 and Present. Uh, we submitted the uh, first major draft. It's a 74-page document of information that has been culled over the years from various authors and venues um, that will kind of showcase in different forms of how the city of Evanston were culpable in preventing uh, the African-American community from growing. Uh, the table of contents, if I'll read off very quickly, uh, it brings a over, historical overview, the history of redlining, segregated practices, employment, services in the public and private arena, schools, housing and zoning policies, policing, lawsuits, and current protests, and it includes illustrations and maps as well. Uh, I believe this document will be ready to be online shortly, um, and know that this document will be periodically updated. So thank you for this opportunity to work on this document. Both Dr. Uh, Thompson and I are very excited to continue working on this document and hope it becomes a very valuable asset for the community and work toward 
uh, the initiatives that the city of Evanston and the community puts forth in use of it. Um, that being said, I have the distinct pleasure to introduce one of Evanston's own. Um, I had the fortune of meeting Edwin B. Jordan Jr. when I was 13 years old at the naming of the Fleetwood Jordan Center in his honor, and I shook his hand. Now, I have to say at 13 years old, I did not realize the impact that, that um, of shaking his hand and meeting the gentleman that had changed the face of politics and community life in Evanston. Since then, I've had the pleasure of working closely with the Jordan family. Um, one of our founding board members was Spencer Jordan's oldest sister, Rose, the late Rose Jordan, who was dragged me, dragged me into her house to work on her documents and move forward. And through that, I've had the wonderful pleasure and working relationship with Spencer Jordan. Spencer Jordan is a ETHS graduate and a Harvard graduate. He's an author and historian. And for many years, he ran a sustainability, uh, he worked as a uh, sustainability consultant. His family work, and I'm gonna share a screen real quick if I can do that. His work accumulated into a collection of uh, books called The Dream Dancers, an American reflection upon past, present, and future that charged the um, family legacy of Jordan and the Hardwicks, Jordan coming from New Bedford, Massachusetts, and the Hardwicks coming from Georgia, as they made their way to Evanston and set a legacy in that family since then. This four volume series charged historical fact mixed with stories, mixed with personal experiences, and the people, the movers, the shakers, the policymakers throughout history in these United States. I had the pleasure of working with him on this, and I'm proud to present to you Spencer Jordan. And Spencer, I think you're on mute. <laughs> oh, no. No, I'm not hearing you, Spencer. Okay, we're having some technical difficulties. Just hold on for one moment. Spencer, say something. No. Can our staff unmute him? He's unmuted. It's just, I think it's on his side of the computer. I wonder if his, Spencer, maybe your volume is turned way down. Oh no. I'm so sorry for this technical difficulty. This is uh... Jeez. Should we go to the next agenda point, Alderman Simmons, and then circle back to him? And meanwhile, Dino, maybe give him a call directly to work him through the any tech difficulties? I was hoping not to have to do that with such a great introduction, but for I the sake of time, um, we will actually move ahead. And I believe that, um, let's see, my agenda. Not Next, we have an, I'll, I'll actually do the introduction. Um, next, we met them in December at our initial town hall, the NARC Commissioners, an organization that was convened by Dr. Ron Daniels in 2015, an organization made up of uh, attorneys and judges and, and medical professionals and activists and those that have been in the movement and fighting for justice for generations make up this commission. They have um, invested into localities across the nation while they also uplift this and support HR 40. They are looking to um, continue advancing and localizing reparations. And they have a model 
Um, if we have cities that had contact from other cities that are going to be joining us tonight, they have a 10 point plan um, that you can reference. But in our case here in Evanston, they've been present, present. They've been a phone call away. They have uh, settled our frustrations and filled us up with information um, when we were when we needed it most. Um, they have given us the encouragement and even an outline, and they have lent us our own uh, Judge Lionel Jean Baptiste. Um, to be available to us all the time. And we have really worn him out. So that's why he's sitting there looking so exhausted tonight because <laughs> because we call on him so much. Um, but I just want to say um, this group has made our work possible. And I want to say thank you. I think I may have left out Cam Howard when I talked about the initial, um, the Evanston specific team and Cam Howard, we know him. He's been very present in Evanston. He's the uh, national co-chair of in Cobra. Um, so with that, we want to thank each of the commissioners for being here. We are uh, really grateful, and we look forward to you sharing your assessment of our work thus far in Evanston. You're on mute. Good evening. Am I okay now? Yeah. Good evening, Evanston. In the midst of all the current and bad news and the convergence of systemic past trauma and harms, we come to this town hall with a gaze towards hope, reparatory justice, and the claim of reparations. I am Iva Johnson Wells Carruthers, a <laughs> proud Evastonian and a member of the National African American Reparations Commission. I consider that role and responsibility a sacred one, doing the work that our four parents passed on for us to get us to the finish line. Four generations ago, my great grandparents chipped in their little dimes to contribute to the stained glass windows at Ebenezer. And 50 years ago, the pastor of Ebenezer was Reverend Jacob Blake. Today, his grandson is struggling for his life as he lies victim of racialized state violence against yet another black man. Eviston was appointed and destined for this epic moment. At the last town hall meeting in which our commission was here, I was delighted to share some stories of his father with Jacob Jr., who I saw grow up. And he was so excited to hear of his dad. Tonight, we lift this family up in our prayers of thanksgiving and healing for what they did for this community and what they are doing now for this nation. Evanston, the light and burden of courageous leadership awaits your success. This is the beginning of a long journey and under the awesome, awesome, phenomenal leadership of Alderwoman Simmons, the subcommittee and stakeholders, I and we stand ready to assist. You are making history and most importantly, you are setting a table of life and dignity for those yet to come. So please don't turn back. Okay, all right, uh, I'm unmuted now. I was hoping that uh, really was eager to hear the uh, the keynote address on uh, Spencer Jordan, but I guess uh, because it's been such an impressive program, let me just say, in terms of what we've heard so far. Uh, let me just quickly uh, give a shout out to um, some of the persons from the HR 40 strategy group that we convene uh, around HR 40 that's been referenced. <clears throat> some of them uh, during our call today said that they might tune in. Uh, also, there may well be some representatives from Providence, Rhode Island on the call. We had an excellent meeting with them this afternoon, and I said, well, if you want to see how it's done, you need to tune into the town hall meeting. So I don't know whether they made it or not, but I certainly want to give them uh, a shout out. Uh, certainly to our keynote speaker, whom we are eager to hear from later, uh, the, the just the, the introduction and the books that he's written uh, are inspirational in and of themselves. We certainly want to, um, again, as everyone has said, uh, salute our courageous, visionary, uh, and persistent leader, uh, Alderman Robin Bruce Simmons, who has uh, done such an incredible job, as well as the Reparations Subcommittee, 
Uh, and I have to give a special shout out. I was so glad to meet her with Alderman Ann Rainey because <laughs> Alderman Ann Rainey has said over and over again, I'm the one who's the guardian of the money. <laughs> I have not forgotten that. And so she has been an ally who has been, uh, you know, in charge of the money and certainly the indispensable role of uh, Alderman uh, Peter Braithwaite uh, in this process. And also, it is also, we've also uh, mentioned the trailblazer, uh, the trailblazer, the long distance runner uh, who has done so much, a uh, longtime friend. We, we often do work together around Haiti, uh, but in the per for this purpose is John, Judge Lionel uh, Joan Baptiste, who helped lay the foundation. Uh, and Alderman Robin Bruce Simmons speaks to that uh, in terms of uh, having built on that. Uh, we also just want to uh, give a shout out to the city council of those members who have been attending and who have been engaged and who have been involved because this process is one that obviously takes uh, the work of a lot of people. The stakeholders, many of the stakeholders, Dino Robinson, who we got a chance to meet in that great uh, tour that we took that was so illuminating uh, that he did. Pastor uh, Monty Dillard, um, you know, who hosted us for the town hall meeting, and of course, uh, Pastor uh, Michael Neighbors. Uh, who is also playing an indispensable role. We are primar primarily here tonight to offer commendations to all of you. And let me just say the reports that we just heard, the education report, I mean, goodness gracious, that was such a, such a, such a phenomenal report, uh, Brother Wilkins and your team. I mean, it was so thoughtfully done and it shows the energy that's going into it. So that's, you know, so exciting to hear uh, the work of the education committee and the other reports that actually have um, have been made. And so again, we want to say a job well done to all of you who have um, who have worked uh, to bring us to this moment. And we've had the pleasure of working with you. Well, as you recall, when we uh, came to Evanston uh, back in December at the invitation of Robin Bruce Simmons, we had a very basic goal. And that goal was to help make Evanston uh, a model for reparations initiatives around the country. That was our goal. And tonight, based on the final assessment that we have sent, and hopefully many of you have had a chance to read, uh, we're here to say uh, that in that assessment, we certify that Evanston has reached that goal. And you reached that goal because as uh, Alderman Braithwaite uh, mentioned earlier, you know, our task was simply to offer uh, our expertise to the degree that we have it uh, in laying out what were the sort of key uh, definitions, what were the key principles, what were the key, key uh, criteria, what were the key kinds of structures that needed to be put in place in order for a reparations initiative to be distinctive from ordinary public policy, which is important because around the country there is a great surge and an excellent surge, a commendable surge an interest in reparations. But in many instances, people really have not had the history or the background or really have any have a real sense of what reparations should look like based on the principles of international law and the kind of work that has been developed over these many years. Uh, and so, but however, that's a good impulse. We love that impulse because it means people are, are really eager to press forward uh, in this moment. But Evanston has, um, you know, took charge and began to, to, to put it together. And let me just quickly summarize uh, some of the things that we found uh, in that regard. That there's been an ongoing educational and co consultation with the black community at large, as you heard tonight, to generate uh, remedies to repair the harm of de facto segregation, redlining, economic underdevelopment, inadequate public education, uh, and so forth. This input has augmented the re recommendations that were already had been received during a process which had been developed by uh, Alderman Robin Lou Simmons. And so that collective process, we think, is extraordinarily important. So extraordinarily important. Substantive, substantive discussions with the stakeholder group. Uh, one of the most impressive things, and by the way, the, the, the visit was just, we were totally inspired by coming to Evanston and seeing the way it was organized and the stakeholders uh, when we went to the, the meeting and the, the center in the community and we sat around the table with what, maybe 40 or 50 stakeholders, 
uh, from various backgrounds, various disciplines. Um, that was an impressive group and was deliberately and intentionally put together uh, by Alderman Robin Bruce Simmons in consultation uh, with Judge Lionel and others, including Dr. Carruthers, who also contributed some ideas about stakeholders who uh, should be at the table. Well, the reality is that though there's been substantive consultations with this group on a continual basis. As a result of those consultations, a reparation stakeholder authority, authority has been formed uh, as an official body that will receive input from the community on a continual basis. Re the reparation stakeholder authority will vet and vote on proposals for reparative remedy and advance those decisions to the reparation subcommittee of city council. And subsequently, the subcommittee will it submit those decisions uh, to the uh, from the state of the stakeholders uh, authority to the full city council. The reparation state, state, stakeholders authority is also finalizing, as uh, Alderman Braithwaite uh, uh, alluded to earlier, uh, in order to make sure that this is permanent. Because one of the other things we have heard is they, that there's a desire not to this for this to be episodic. There's a desire for this to be permanent. And so to last beyond the tenure of Alderman um, Simmons and the current uh, reparation subcommittee and so forth. And so a process is being uh, formulated, uh, an application process is being formulated to be to institutionalize the whole notion of submitting reparations proposals. Finally, and of no small significance, <clears throat> one of the things that we have pointed out as a distinctive feature of reparations initiatives is the ability for black people, for black stakeholders, to have the capacity to administer funds in order to make decisions, and not when decisions are made, to have to be able to have a fund in order to allocate resources. And in that regard, the Evanston Community Foundation, uh, we understand, has agreed to serve as the fiscal agent for an independent reparations fund that will be administered by the Reparations Stakeholders Authority. So we see these as very, very, very impressive uh, accomplishments in relationship, you know, to the kinds of principles and processes, you know, which we outlined and which uh, we talked about. And so this we see as, uh, again, um, uh, an important beginning. We want to say to all of those who are watching, all of those who are on and who are viewing this and so forth, that this is a community-based process. You've all com committed to it. One of the things that we noted in the uh, education report is there are extensive consultations with the community, which is incredibly important because we have been so traumatized as black people, but very often we, we disengage, we don't participate. And I'm a strong believer that democracy is not just elections, participation equals democracy. And so it was interesting to just see the way in which you are conducting uh, those meetings. But it will be important really for the community to also be vigilant as the first, and by the way, the, the nation is watching and awaiting for the first actual reparations grant to be awarded because it will be historic. But the community must be vigilant. Uh, this is not something that you can be detached from. Uh, you must keep hold public officials accountable. You must be engaged in the process of ensuring that the principles and the criteria and the process is adhered to. This is not the end of the process. This is the beginning. But what an incredible beginning it is. So I just want to again, you know, we're here to validate, to offer our commendations and our salute uh, for the work that has been done. Uh, so now I'd like to just turn to other commissioners for their comments. Uh, Dr. Ivor Carruthers has already submitted her comments. So I'd now like to turn to Cam Howard, the national co-chairperson of Encobra. Thank you, Dr. Daniels, and also want to thank the Reparations Subcommittee of Evanston and all of the participants in this process, the citizens of Evanston who have taken the mantle of making sure that this is something that truly can be replicated. Today, more and more Americans are coming to the realization and understanding that a tremendous debt is owed to the African American community. In a recent national poll, 90% of Democrats and 50% of all Americans favor some form of reparations. In addition, more and more Americans are seeing that prolonging the engagement in, in addressing this debt only pretends greater and greater civil unrest and economic harm to the entire country. 
the city of Evanston inaugurated local action and responsibility to work toward addressing and satisfying this debt. Chicago, with the third largest black population of any American city, Asheville, a city deeply entrenched in the South, where still the majority of blacks live, the state of California with a $3.2 trillion budget, a GPD, the largest of any state in the United States, and if it was a country, it would be the fifth largest behind the US, China, Japan, and Germany. All have, at, have been added to the active role of localizing reparations to address this debt. All of this initial action is extremely important for three major reasons. One, there is no turning back. The door is open and the lid has been lifted off the box. And as in Cobra has stated in public comment at the Everson City Council vote, and again at the first town hall meeting in awarding Alderman Simmons, the reckoning has in fact begun. There will be no satisfaction until we see profound changes in the lives of blacks in this country that only reparations can meet. Two, we're witnessing an explosion of other cities and states endeavoring to meet this justice issue of repair. This, we are certain, will push the national demand for reparations via H.R. 40 and S. 1083, the House and Senate Reparations Bill. And three, finally, we'll see that each of these cities and states, with Evanston in the forefront, are creating structures, processes, policies, and initiatives that will be ready to receive federal resources with the passage of the federal legislation. So we would like to encourage you, all of Everson, to stay focused, continue the forward motion, and know that your collective leadership continues to have national implications. The National African American Reparations Commission and the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America is with you all the way. Thank you. Okay, and now uh, our, our multi-pastor par excellence the one that they said was so memorable that they remembered her name, uh, attorney Nkichi Taifa of the Taifa Group and a uh, human rights lawyer and her book is soon to be out and it's gonna pop immediately to the top of all the list. And yon it is, uh, attorney Nkichi Taifa. <laughs> You're on mute. <laughs> Thank you so very much, Dr. Daniels. Reparations is an idea whose time has come. The issue was once in the not too distant past unthinkable by mainstream America as viable public policy. But Evanston was a trailblazer and was on the map early on in 2002 when under the leadership of Judge Lionel Baptiste, the city council passed legislation to endorse the Federal Study Commission Bill HR 40. And today, pursuant to the trailblazing vision of Alderman Robin Wu Simmons, a historic milestone marker and possible blueprint for other jurisdictions has been advanced. The first time public dollars have been specifically set aside for a reparations initiative. Thank you, Evanston. You have shown the nation that we cannot wait any longer to address racially exclusionary policies. We can't wait any longer to address the lack of opportunity. We can't wait any longer to deal with the underdevelopment of black families and neighborhoods. We can't wait any longer to address the racial wealth gap in Evanston. We can't wait any longer for justice. Why can't we wait? Because our ancestors' blood cries out. Thank you, Evanston. All right. The inimitable uh, Nkichi Tai Ifa. Well, we'd now like to uh, turn to our special guest who has joined us. Um, we hope that Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee will be able to join us. I did. She did indicate that she was flying back uh, to um, Houston this afternoon, though Houston did not take a direct hit. Uh, there are people who are actually are going to Houston in order to be sheltered and whatnot, and she wanted to be sure that everything's in order. And she thought she might be on a flight uh, at this time. So we're not absolutely sure that she'll be able to join. But we are so uh, delighted uh, that our UN ambassador uh, for the decade of African, people of African descent has joined us. And we, I really, really reached out to, to Danny to join us because um, that town hall meeting that was organized by Evanston 
was one of the most remarkable experiences I've ever been a part of. It was simply electric. It was spiritual. It was culture. It was uplifting. And I really hope that people who are, are listening and who are engaged will remember that because that energy, that tremendous energy really helped to propel it forward. It doesn't mean that it's not a rocky road, that you don't have contradictions and unevenness, but as long as you can keep that spirit, uh, we're in good shape. And certainly uh, Danny Glover uh, rose to the occasion on that even evening, and he really, really, you know, uh, gave us a lot to think about. And he is one who has consistently supported uh, reparations and uh, consistently supported the work of the National African American Reparations around the country. So I'd now like to just ask uh, Danny Glover uh, for his comments and his remarks at this time. Uh, please welcome Danny Glover. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Alderman Ramey, Alderwoman, Alderman, Simon, Simons, and, and certainly uh, also uh, Alderman, uh, I'm trying to find all these names here. I had them written down. But all of you, it, 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 the pleasure to be here is, is quite extraordinary. I'm, I'm so sorry that it's impossible to see me virtually. I'm still learning how to maneuver around this new technology and have the proper lighting. It is now uh, about six o'clock in San Francisco and, and, and the sun is still out. And, and, but, but certainly I'm, I'm uh, and Brother Breakforth as well. And I, I'm so excited for that. Thank you so much for the reports you just issued, uh, the, the aspirations issued uh, and expressed at this historic moment. Uh, when, when I think about reparations, as I begin to, to begin to uh, think more and more about its implementation, where we see it applied, and the, bring, the bringing together of efforts, the efforts to bring together the community as engaged, as, as the sister Taifa said, when engaged in community. And Brother Howard also mentioned the role that community plays in this extraordinary moment. Um, and, and when I talk about things, think about reparation, one of the things that has certainly has been, is, 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 uh, has been important in that thinking is the role that education plays. As Brother Wilkins talked about education and, and the, 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 the steps taking to repair the educational system as well. I've been fortunate enough to be involved in a, in a very strong campaign about quality education as a constitutional right. We need to know that there's no, there's nowhere in the constitution where quality education is a constitutional right. It's been left to the, 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 the whims of the state and, and often local authorities to deal with that. We've been working with the algebra project and the MASH and the MAP initiative and an extraordinary event that happened in the sixth, the sixth district court, circuit court, where the court awarded the city of, of Detroit a, a, a sum of, of money around the issue of foundational education as a constitutional right in heaven. Now, there are several cases around that that are happening around the country in, in litigation around the country. But the litigation uh, in, in the, at the end of April set a foundation. Now, of course, the full court vacated the decision, but not did not vacate the reward itself. So it's an important step in the idea of education as a constitutional right. And more importantly, the role that certain organizations, the math initiative and then the algebra project is played in saying that 21st century education means math, excuse me, 21st century citizenship means last math literacy. And the emphasis on last math literacy, as opposed as we understand the right to vote in the 20th century, in the 20th century, was the indication or platform for citizenship. Math literacy is important to that. But also the idea, the ideas around shape, shaping, shaping our, our, our thinking around the role that education plays in, 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 in terms of housing, in terms of 
uh, resource development. You take from my city in San Francisco, where the population is 6% African American. As a child growing up, it was 12% African American through gentrification and other uh, herbal removal, removal and other things. That, that number of population is decreased. In, in fact, that is 6%, 37% of the citizens in San Francisco are homeless. Of the home, homeless, 30, of, of the homeless population in San Francisco, 30%, 7% of them are African American. So there's something that my city can learn from this, Doctor, this, what is happening in Everston. Dr. Amos Brown, Reverend Amos Brown, has been leading the struggle for reparations in San Francisco, allowing or pro providing a platform for the city council or the board of supervisors in San Francisco to take action on that. But your your actions here have certainly enlightened and and certainly raised the consciousness and raised the conversation about about reparation, and that's what needs to happen. As this is as 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 as, as brother brother Howard said that this time has come, that there's no turning back, as Sister Taifa said, there's no turning back. And you right here will be remembered as we go through the, 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 the annuals in, our, in, the, in the past, just as my grandmother was, it will be remembered, who said when the overseer came to pick up her and her children to go to work in the fields in, a, in a early, it's early September, and the, and the overseer said to, to my grandmother, Risa May Huntley, where are the children at? It's not raining outside. And boldly as Risa May Huntley, my children are in school. They don't go work in the fields when they're school. Consequently, my mother graduated from Payne College in Augusta, Georgia in 1942. Those are the stories that remember. Those stories will go down in all our collective memory as you begin to move forward intensify this 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 at this this to sit this court engage it and give other cities other communities the courage to raise it to its highest level and we have so many opportunities we also have to understand that we have to find the various coalitions as well as we fight around education as we fight around uh, 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 around mass incarceration as we fight around community development and, and, and redistribution of, 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 of wealth in this country. Those are the kind of battles that await for us because, as Ron says, the attack is going to happen. That's inevitable. The attack on us, the attack on this moment, to, to, to diminish this moment, to circumvent this moment, to have those people who act as our leaders in this, which you are, Try to ch ch change the direction of this moment, but this direction, ha uh, this the direction, of this moment must be definitive. It must be in our, in our, for our children and for the future as well. So thank you for being here with this moment with you, as I'll be with you in other moments as well. I've been I've been incredibly blessed. I'm the grandson of of former sharecroppers who were able to save enough money to buy their own farm. I'm the great grand grandson of a, a formerly enslaved African, May Huntley, who was born in 1858. I'm the I'm the also the beneficiary of, of, of a proud program at San, San Francisco State, where we fought for a school of ethnic studies, and particularly start without beginning with a, uh, a which is still 50 or in its 51st year. So those are the things that have, have certainly encourage me and build the kind of substance that I believe I'm about in my life, not only as a citizen, and I clearly say a citizen first, but an artist as well. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much, Danny Glover. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. So now um, I yield back to uh, um, uh, Alderman uh, for the balance of the programs that that concludes uh, the presentation by the National African American Reparations Commission. Uh, we will await uh, whether or not uh, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee calls in. I actually going to put my phone back on. I didn't want her to maybe call me in the middle of my presentation as she has done on occasion. So maybe she will call me because maybe she doesn't have the link or something. But we did provide it for her. 
but I yield back. And thank you so much. And as uh, Danny Glover said, this is, you know, you're on the forefront and uh, we want to help keep you on the forefront. We got your back. Thank you. It means a lot. Um, and, and Danny, if you're able to just turn the light on in your room, even that might um, help. Um, but either way, Dino, have you had any luck with getting uh, Mr. Jordan? I think we have a solution. Mr. Jordan, can you uh, say hello? Hello. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try one thing that I researched. It'll take five seconds and it'll either work or it will not work. Uh, here it goes. Can you hear me now? Yes. No. You can hear me. No, that, that didn't work out. So we'll stick with what okay. we have. Well, thank you, uh, Dino, and thank you, Alderman Simmons, and thank you, subcommittee. Uh, I've been very uh, just enamored of, uh, of listening to all the progress that's been made. Uh, it's simply wonderful. And uh, I thank you for the honor, then, of sharing, uh, uh, being able to share my thoughts on the legacy of uh, Alderman Edwin D. Jordan, who is my dad in ushering in some of the foundational initiatives for reparations uh, back in the 16-year uh, struggle uh, for black rights from 1931 to 1947. Uh, the first black people to come to the, from the South to live in Evanston brought the dream of at least one small aspect of redemptive compensation, and that was in the form of fair late wages that had been propelled uh, by those like my uh, my grandparents who came from Georgia and their young daughter, who was my mom, and they were part of the Great Migration. And they arrived in 1924 uh, at the same year uh, as my dad, but about 11 months ahead of him. Uh, they both lived uh, on uh, Asbury Avenue, right in the hub of the uh, the uh, then uh, center of the of the Black uh, West Side community. And my dad worked for the Chicago Defender as a, he rose to become city manager. Uh, he, he, uh, was propelled eastward from New Bedford by this grand vision of black progress that was taking place in Chicago. But he became enamored with Evanston and its aspiring black community. And so he moved here in the, around 1924. And he soon fell in love with my Georgia born mom and became one with the goals of the black community. So when in 1931, the city sought to divide the black community through redistricting the fifth ward, uh, Edwin used his editorial skills to galvanize the black community uh, and uh, uh, to uh, uh, urge them to resist this uh, redistricting effort. And I'll read a, a, slight, uh, a quick, uh, uh, outtake from the Evanston and former uh, newspaper at that time. Uh, he had a sense of humor along with incisive wit. And here's what he said about redistricting. The redistricting will be made the excuse for chopping out the very heart of a united community that is together, belongs together, and has every right to stay together. Whoever dissects the fifth ward in such a fashion knows that he is slicing the colored community's most effective social agency from the masses of residents. He knows that unless a ward system where aldermen serve their best interests uh, is making a political wall between the colored people and their leadership. And therefore he recommended that the, that we elect our own aldermen. And uh, with that article, uh, which also brought a, a, a lot of humor, uh, the, he was asked to be that leader to run for office, and he he did and won. Okay, so that was how uh, political power became the basis for um, all of the uh, the uh, the subsequent uh, advances that were made. Without the political base, it never could have uh, taken place. So uh, Edwin's first success uh, was fought, which was redeeming political power back to the people of, of Evanston and the black community. Uh, 
if I could ask, uh, we could ask uh, Edwin what he might think today about what he was doing and what he was trying to do. My guess is that he would suggest that he was indeed thinking about uh, the redemption of, of, uh, of equal power to black people as a concept that of holistic repair that would embrace truly equalizing political, social, educational, environmental, and now also urgently economic development of our historic black community. So the, the concept that uh, of, of holistic uh, uh, development is something I heard tonight, the educational report, the various committee reports, uh, the, the uh, establishment of awareness and going around the town spreading a message about how uh, reparation will help the entire community as well as the black community. All of these things were very interesting to me because they were making use of every part of our social culture to gain equalization. So I, I was just am amazed by that, uh, as I think uh, uh, Ambassador Glover was too. Uh, so uh, along with political power, in his first year, he went right to work. And one of the things that happened was that he desegregated the city theaters within the first five months of, him, of his office. In the second year, he desegregated organized sports games in the city public park. And that liberated the tremendous and uplifting impact of, of all the of Black City Park Mason uh, Park and Foster Field, especially because of the Rams and the Flashes. I think that few of us could still remember those those uh, those teams. And uh, it also provided the whole idea of another route. Uh, into interracial interactions and uh, also educational opportunities. So the the, the that desegregation of the of the sports in the park uh, had a great redemptive value and an energizing value for the community. Uh, the, one of the other things that that uh, he did was uh, individual and community physical health. Uh, for instance. Uh, he achieved a uh, repair of, of inequitable city uh, services, uh, such as the lack of, of insurance of electric power, trash collection, and he, that he then made the city guarantee for all the uh, 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 doctor's offices and our proud community hospital. And the other thing he did was even uh, uh, demand and get the... Uh, city to block off streets uh, where there were ill people uh, that were very ill so that they could have the same quiet that wealthier people had on their streets when they were trying to recover. So he went right to work on all of these areas to repair the inequities that existed in the city in terms of its health and city services. Uh, he also backed the, the uh, initiative of a determined group of uh, aspiring black educators who wished to teach in Evanston schools. It was a battle that would go on for several years until success was achieved in, 10 years later in the 1940s. Also in the mid-30s, he organized and led a popular symposium that uh, he himself talked uh, to uh, youth at the Emerson Street Y and what, uh, what became regular symposium that gave the, the long history of black accomplishment to youth, Evanston youth, from ancient Egypt to the current times. And his efforts were so popular and successful that the Y led, uh, asked him to join the YMCA board. That's the great Emerson Street Y we we're talking about. <laughs> that great video, that the documentary that was made on that. Uh, and uh, he served on that board for a, a, a number of years and was uh, remembered with pride by his students. I remember going in, uh, uh, or then elder, uh, going into barbershops and hearing people say, yeah, I, I was in that class and, and uh, we learned this and that about Booker T. Washington, about W.E.B. Du Bois and so forth and so on. And so uh, he was very much involved in structuring pride and, and relevant information to youth in the, uh, in the 1930s on uh, whatever resources we had, which was the why. Uh, so therefore, the uh, in the late 1940s, the long for integration of the elementary schools for students would begin 
during the final period of his career. And even the public library finally gave us uh, equal access to the public library in 1948. Uh, Another thing that he was very uh, uh, foundational uh, part of, of reparations, which you heard a lot again tonight in the meeting, was housing, in which the, key, the keystone for school integration, it's the keystone for job location, and uh, his, his uh, passion for equal housing began actually when he was at Harvard, when he, uh, uh, historian Arthur Schlesinger, uh, uh, cited how he changed Harvard culture, which he was the same way he would later do in, in Evanston, uh, by sparking a, a several year effort that stopped the, the segregation of, of student housing there. And he, when he came to Evanston, he launched the same, uh, initiative to, uh, desegregate housing in at Northwestern University, which he said again was the key to, you know, really true participation in the education for students there. Uh, but his most significant housing battle came at the end of his career, which in the 1947 and 48, uh, when he took on uh, the fight for fair integrated bettering housing, uh, the when which was built for in a segregated fashion. Those of us, I don't know how many people, not very many people remember those days. Okay, but uh, they built uh uh, a first class, uh, uh, veteran housing on the, uh, on the north side, which is the white side of the canal, and a much distinctly inferior housing for black veterans on the south side of the canal uh, in the fifth ward. And, uh, what he did was research the private, all of the processes that lay under, that maintained, uh, how to do keep segregation uh, going in housing, even though the public laws were stating, you know, uh, equality. And that uh, intricate pattern between federal uh, policies and local government policies and the policies of builders and property owners uh, came is even to this day, which also introduced redlining and brought in the banks and so forth and so on. It was a very complex and subtle process, but he brought it to light. Uh, and on his, the final months of his uh, 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 career in uh, in city government, so uh, he was, did foundational, uh, oh, tremendous foundational work in in education and housing and and uh, parks and social, uh, you know, uh, uh, equal social services and uh, medicine, uh, you know, first class first health care for uh, his for the West Side uh, resident. So that leaves us with one uh, 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 element that is everyone on everyone's mind in the last uh, decade or so, and that's economic development. Uh, this is a key part of uh, reparations uh, today and ought to be. And uh, it is foundational to all the others going in the other direction, all the other aspects of social and economic and educational equality. So although, you know, in the middle, middle of the uh, 20th century, uh, that was the era of his uh, leadership, uh, there was, uh, it was over before uh, the powerful takeoff of black economic development in, uh, starting in the 1960s. Uh, however, uh, this cascade of new city services, city jobs wherever possible, the rousing sense of community pride uh, was, uh, confirmed in two of the, the most powerful expressions of the city's pride in his leadership. And that did come from the business community. And uh, they, in which uh, the, there were two letters that were written to uh, the city council. And they, uh, it was saying, stop trying to get rid of our, our Alderman Jordan. He has done more for this community, and we're totally happy with his leadership, and we want you to stop trying to get him out of office. And one came from all of the uh, leaders of, and owners of uh, West Side City businesses, and they wrote a scalding letter uh, stating that uh, 
stating those what I just said. And then simultaneously, and uh, an obvious concert, a second letter was written by uh, by the proudly, what they call the proudly everyday black citizens, i.e. blue-collar working citizens of the West Side. And it was equally scathing and saying, don't even try to attempt to stop all this progress that is being made. And uh, these results showed what the people felt about uh, uh, Alderman Jordan, what he had brought to West Side citizens. So uh, I would just like to conclude uh, this by saying that uh, what he had, you can see in so many uh, uh, areas, was a holistic vision for the future of the city. And by goodness, that is exactly what I heard. And I'm not kidding you, or I'm not, not prone to flattery or anything like that. This is exactly what I've been hearing all night at this committee. You, the progress, he would be absolutely so elated to to see and watch what has come uh, out of his early efforts. The generation, the vision that he had for a a city uh, a West Side Center that would be state of the art and have the all the arts and dance and music and libraries and health facilities and sports teams uh, and that vision that he started and worked so hard for in 1934 and all the rest, it did come to fruition. And we know that we have the Fleetwood Jordan uh, Center, uh, which is a uh, an expression of that dream that he had. You, you in this meeting, I think, are, are representing the sum of what he talked about. People who never took down the, the, the flag, never stop to fight and with intelligence and education and spirit uh, that you, 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 I think are the, the exemplification and the culmination of his dream. Uh, I know he would, he, he would just say his favorite expression, why that's mighty, mighty fine. <laughs> and I'll leave you with those thoughts. And thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about some of the foundational things that he did that have now become a part, and so clearly now through this this meeting that I've been a privilege to attend, uh, is now a, a, a reality. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Jordan, so much for that. You know, even listening to you as much work as I do. I still learn something new each and every time I talk to you. So I had no idea about the uh, equal access to the Evanston Public Library in 1948. So that's newer to me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Thank you for um, continuing to share um, the legacy of your father's work. We are building on it in Evanston. Um, we are a city of leaders. I've been saying that a lot lately. And um, his example is one that has emboldened us to really swing for the fences as we think about ways to uh, uplift the black community and improve the black community. So he would in fact um, be proud of our work and that is satisfying. So thank you. Before I wrap, uh, Dr. Daniels, I wanna make sure that the Congresswoman was not able to make it on the call or if she was. Well, no, she would have called in. I mean, she had okay. uh, she had a, the, a link was uh, provided to Keenan Keller for her to call in. So he was to transfer it to her and whatnot. So uh, I'm not sure whether that did or did not happen. But um, and again, she did say she was on a flight, and you know, it was it was going to be somewhat complicated. So uh, okay. But I I do know that as you well know, she is so proud of you, and she's so proud of the work, and that's why we wanted to have her come in and add her validation. So. Uh, she probably will do a statement or something subsequently, uh, but she's on the case and uh, she's working tirelessly for HR 40. She is uh, indefatigable in terms of the work that she does, but she is very constituent focused. And so she really wanted to make sure that uh, those persons who were being housed and who had to flee from over in um, uh, 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 Beaumont and, and, and those areas uh, that they were taken well care of. So that's, that's our Congresswoman. 
Indeed. And when I saw the report of uh, unsurvivable um, damages, I thought then that we may not um, see her as she would be caring for um, her neighbors and friends in the Houston area where she serves. Um, but those that are watching do know that she was a presenter at our last town hall meeting, which is on our reparation website. So if we could have someone put our reparation website in the chat, you can watch our last town hall where the Congresswoman gave us updates. She gave us um, feedback on the work that we're doing here in Evanston, and she gave us updates on HR 40, which she continues to lead. Um, if you want to learn ways on how you can support HR 40, please do follow uh, the NARC uh, social pages as well as their uh, IBW uh, website. If someone could put that in the chat as well, um, that would be helpful. So we just want to, again, thank everyone for, um, for attending. And I want to make sure that I don't conclude without thanking my colleagues on the city council. So while this work is um, informed by the community, it took a uh, vote of city council to actually pass this resolution. So thank you to the members of the Ed Evanston City Council and to our staff um, for working on this. Also want to thank um, our Senator Laura Fine. I believe she made uh, the Zoom. She's been one of our earliest um, supporters and uh, she was expected to come tonight. And then I need to let um, the residents of Evanston know that Congresswoman Jan Joukowsky, as well as Dick Durbin have contacted me um, personally to send their uh, support and their uh, pride in the commitment that we have here in Evanston. So I just wanted to pass that along as well. And then there were a couple of things that were mentioned. One is a reparation stakeholder authority. And that is a process policy that I mentioned uh, that we will um, take action on tomorrow in our subcommittee meeting. And that is important because it will institutionalize this work. This work um, is needed because of generations of damages in the community. So we certainly hope that it will live beyond any of our leadership, certainly beyond the 10 years that it initially is proposed and really in perpetuity um, here in the city of Evanston. So this was developed and designed um, with a lot of feedback from us uh, by uh, Judge Lionel Jean Baptiste. And this will institutionalize this work, seeing to it that the stakeholder community uh, leads the conversation, the remedy, and ultimately, when an independent nonprofit is able to be established, uh, direct the funding. So we are in the early uh, stages of conversation with the foundation, which was mentioned. And um, the goal is for the foundation soon to open a reparation fund that is able to be um, maybe more nimble than um, funds that are going through um, the city council and public funds from cannabis sales tax. Um, in addition, I um, want to note that not only is a congresswoman uh, visiting our, our last town hall on the website, all of our other um, documents are on the website as well, including the State of Black Housing report that was given. It was a national report as well as a hyper-local State of Black Housing report for Evanston. It gives data on housing discrimination, and um, specifically, it talks a lot about uh, mortgage lending practices and disparities there. And with that, we have been working to um, solidify a local financial institution as a partner as we continue the work specifically in housing and financial empowerment and literacy so that we have products that are designed and partner to support the goals of reparation lending products, mortgage products, financial literacy and education and other tools that are gonna be very necessary. So you will hear more about that as those relationships are finalized. And in addition to that, we have, um, if you are looking to learn more about reparations or if you are an ally and looking to be a champion for reparations, uh, Dear Evanston, which is founded and led by um, Nina Caven, Kamon Hendricks, is on staff now, they are putting together a uh, reparation ambassador program. And so you can follow Dear Evanston 
um, to learn more about that as it develops. And then the stakeholders. So what an amazing video. You know, when I saw the video earlier, it really was inspiring to see so many um, diverse um, members of our black community uh, representing and in support of reparations. I love the video. I'm going to be sharing it all the time. So just so that you know that um, it's going to get wore out. But um, that group represents the black community, the leaders, whether you're leading in your household, on your block, in institutions here in Evanston, this work needs to be led by you. And we'll be convening our next uh, community-wide stakeholder meeting soon in the in the second week of September once school is a little more settled in everyone is settled um, but we don't want to wait much longer because we haven't met since December and so different groups have been meeting on different topics but we certainly want to get together to make sure everyone is updated and make sure that um, we still have the same priorities um, in the light of the um, conditions that we are dealing with now with um, with COVID so we want to we want to touch base there so look for more information on that. And with that, we have a um, meeting tomorrow. All are welcome. Um, if you can put the uh, meeting information in the chat, someone on staff, that would be helpful. The meetings are at 9 a.m. They're on Zoom, public meetings. Um, there is public comment. So that is an opportunity for more engagement. It's a bit more interactive. Um, you have an opportunity to speak directly to the committee and um, we hope that you do. And I think that is it. Alderman Braithwaite or Alderman Rainey, are there, is there anything that I may have missed that we should touch on while we have everyone's attention? No, oh, I think you covered everything. Thank you. Okay. Okay, great. So with that, please do remember to keep Jacob Blake in your prayers for a complete healing um, for him, keep the family in your prayers. Lift up Evanston. We are hurting. He is one of our own. Um, the family has requested um, our presence if you are able and if you could do it safely in Kenosha on Saturday at 2 o'clock. There are going to be uh, carpools and other transportation leaving Evanston at 12 noon. Um, look for more details on that on social media. I've been posting on my page. Others, I'm sure, will do the same. And thank you, Evanston really proud to be an Evanstonian in these ugly times that we're in right now. Um, we have a lot of work to do, but we have committed to do the work and we have begun the work. It's been an uncomfortable journey, like uh, like a, a group of our residents took an uncomfortable uncom journey. We are on that uncomfortable journey, but we're united. We're doing it together. If you think you need more education on why reparations for the black community, please do. Uh, follow what we're doing at our subcommittee meetings. Please do follow uh, Shorefront Legacy to learn more about our history in Evanston. Get more education from NARC. You can follow their social pages as well. They do a lot of great uh, educational sharing. Um, and please do uh, make sure that you reach out to us directly if you have any recommendations or you want to volunteer in any way. And on a final note, Everyone can participate in reparations. There is a fund and thank you to the residents that have already been donating. We have residents that have given generously to our fund. We hope that that fund grows. $10 million is not enough for us to address the damages in the black community, but it certainly is an amazing commitment. We have residents that have been donating. You can donate at the city of Evanston. There is a link on our website, which is in the chat, or you can send a check directly to the city of Evanston and just make sure you put reparations in the memo and it will be earmarked and restricted for reparative uh, policies in the name of resolution 126R19. And with that, we want to thank you all for coming. Uh, we plan to do this again in the next few months. And in the meantime, you can follow us on our social sites and on our reparation webpage. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you, Robin. Thank you all. Thank you for all who attended. Thank you. Reparations Thank now. Thank you. Reparations yeah. now. Thank good you. Job. All right. Good job, Robin. Thank yes, you. Good night. Bye now.